Hello um, and hi once again. Um, so uh, we're going to be talking about animation and the principles of animation today. Um, just picking up from where just about where we stopped in our last class when we talked about models and rigs. All right, so we're going to talk about animation in a bit more detail. Uh, I'm going to try as much as possible not to fixate on the complicated parts of this. Uh, the aim here is to make this simple, simple enough so you can start doing something yourself. But at the same time, knowing um, a bit of why you are doing what you are doing and how to make those things better. All right, so I'm going to try as much as possible to speak in lay terms uh, and explain a few of the things that we will talk about. Um, so we will use this character that I showed you earlier and still um, use some other generic shapes because animation is not um, tied only to characters with arms and legs and skeletons. Um, you can animate a box, you can animate a shape, all right, um, and you can animate text and still the same um, <coughs> same rules apply in terms of how you make stuff in it. So I'm going to first of all refer back to a web page that I showed you um, in our introductory class by um, Sensor Lodigiani. Uh, and it's a brilliant piece of um, summarization of the principles of animation, 12 principles of animation, they're called. And this is the cornerstone of good animation, whether you're talking about character animation uh, or just animating text or boxes, either in 2D or 3D space. The same rule always apply, right? So, um, I'm imploring that you do not limit the ideas that you will gain here to simply just when I start animating a 3D character, right? That next um, text animation project that you just need to show text coming together uh, to say something or that logo reveal that you want to do, these same rules apply to all of them, all right? So, um, I'm going to ask that you stick with me and um, get as much as you can get from this um, from this class. All right, so we'll start talking a bit about some of the principles, explaining them, and I'll show you examples so you can see how they are useful in that next project that you have. All right, so we'll start with squash and stretch. Um, squash and stretch uh, refers to um, the, the tool um, by which you show the flexibility of the object. All right, there are some objects that are not flexible that are rigid, like furniture, like metal. They cannot exactly see some bend in their shape. But for most organic materials, um, there is always a bit of flexibility to the material and the object that you can play along with. The idea here is that uh, with simple mathematical equations, most software that work with that do animation will give you animation, but um, you want to strive for something more than just in a, a just normal looking animation. You are striving for something that is believable. That is realistic that your audience can um, relate with. Yes, they already know that it is an animation. They already know it's not real, all right. But there's still a suspension, a zone of suspension of disbelief that you can put them in simply because what they are seeing looks real. It looks like what they would experience in their own environment, and that's the that's the core of good animation, is to be able to bring your users who you know they already know that this isn't, and for 
that that those few moments where we are working to suspend um their belief that this is not real and let them just experience the world and the story that you are trying to tell all right so squash and stress refers to the ability of the body to be flexible based on the pressures that are around it um you will notice though that in most cases the volume of that object must always remain the same because if the volume changes then that uh then the, the illusion you are trying to create breaks apart so you must you are trying to or you must try to keep the um, volume of the object the same no matter the uh, flexibility that you are trying to create think about a rubber band for instance and when you stretch it, it stretches and it becomes thinner, all right? But that doesn't mean that the mass or the volume of the rubber band has changed. All that has changed is the length and the scale, the thickness of the, of the band. And you can always return back and still keep, until you know that the rubber band stretched, but you return back and nothing awkward or weird has happened, all right? So, by come back to my scene, how do we feel squash and stretch in real practical terms? So that is the end of the class. All right, so I'm going to do two things. I'm going to show you how we show this with the character and with a simple generic box, which should be equivalent to say a logo you are trying to create in 3D space. All right, um, so squash and stretch. If I were to, let me go with a ball for now. Um, all right, so I'll try and drag this onto a plane so we can get a reference for it. Okay, um, the floor so that we let that idea understand the idea. All right, so we have a ball um, on this surface. All right. And now, when you want to create the, um, and you want to show a ball bouncing, um, animating that is usually should be easy. You, um, let me just get this timeline area to show well. Um, so you want to create the, uh, the motion of ball. Of a ball bouncing, so you can start with the ball at the top position. Um, select your time, which is like the first frame, and press S. S is the way that you key all the frames, all the um, attributes of an object. All right. You can also do the same by holding any of the attributes or moving your mouse over any of the attributes. Left mouse click and say key selected or key all. Now key all is the same thing as pressing the S, but you can also do this and just click key all. Alright, so I press S for that. I can also obviously um, use my auto key feature that comes with Maya, um, which basically just uh, says that after your first keyframe, every other motion that you uh, make will also be keyed. Because you have to be careful with simply just doing making random motion because you will now have too many keys to work with and you may not know where or how you got that many if you are not careful with how you move things around in your scene. But for now, I start with the um key the ball at the top here on frame one. Um I pick frame ten and Put the ball on the floor. Yeah, and then at 20, I take it back up again. And then at 30, I bring it back down. And say 40 up again. Uh, okay, so let's keep it that way. So if I play this through, you have something like this. All right. Now, the now the truth is this that um 
the ball looks very unreal. It does not look like it is being affected by the pressure of the floor when it hits it. You should make it somehow squeeze up a bit as it tries to press uh, with the force of gravity. And then when it pushes up, it, you do not get a sense that the ball is pushing up. Everything um, looks very rigid and um, just unrealistic. Alright, so what you want to do, which is how I show you the sense, the concept of um, um, squash and stretch is, let's take this ball that I've done, let's move it to one side. Uh, okay, I have to be careful because we have animated that. Um, we duplicate this and create the second wall. This is a ball with the animation on it. Okay, this is the second one. Now, if I want to do the same thing, I'm going to try and change the um, center axis so that we start to bottom a bit, just to show the the uh, the function of scaling. All right, so I do the same thing I did for this, which is that at this place I say. Um, I one there, then I get it on the floor. I also key feature is already working, so I don't need to press it. Now, if I go maybe about two frames and then scale down, all right, scale down, come to 20, go back up. Um, again, I can reduce, bring my scale back up. Again, to this, and then a 30 comes down, two frames, now I go down, and then 40, I remove this scaling, and spawn, and take it back up again. Um, now, if I play this too, now you can see that even though we are getting something that looks right, our scale is not working like it should work. It's not starting uh, from where it should start. That's because the scale, you want the scale, the ball should compress after it reaches the floor because the obstacle of the floor now makes pressure compressed on top of it. All right, so you can see that at my in 10, my scale Y has already started reducing, so the only way I can do is just take that back to 1 at those places, take that back to 1 at those places, so that you see that now we're having another problem in that it's not, it's already bouncing up at those frames, so what we want to do is bring it back down here, bring it back down to the floor. Now if I play this, you can begin to see that it begins to look a lot, a little more realistic because you're getting a, a bit of bounce on the ball. All right, this is not perfect, but you can get the sense now. On its upward movement, movement, I may want to now stretch it a bit. All right, stretch it a bit here. And on this place to give that sense of stretch. So here we have a um we have the scaling. Alright. And then here we have some stretching. And then we have some squashing here. And then we have some stretching here. So if I play that through All right, so this is just an example of how you add squash and stretch. This is not exactly perfect because um, our scale should not should begin after this, right, and last for a bit longer than this before we even start going up. Yeah.
left a bit. If I do this to create the sense of the stretch before leaving the floor, as the ball reaches up and play this. Okay, so you can begin to see that this looks a little better. Uh, object is breaking below the surface. Um, I can fix that with a bit of um, fake um, work here, but so we can see the ball reach the ground scales down a bit stretches up before it begins to leave All right um, so if I do that I can see that my other ball begins to look a little more realistic than the ball that just seems to um, be um, Eating the floor but without any effect on the ball, which is just unrealistic because most balls have space and have flexibility around them. So that's how you create the concept of squash and stretch, alright, in your scene. In a character, you do that by say if you want this character, if it's about to jump, your character usually will bend down, alright, before he just goes up. So you you need to create a sense that oh the character is bending down now before he goes up so i was doing a jump for this character say let me key just that waist and in five frames i do a bend all right then here stretch it and then it goes up all right now, of course, I'm not doing work on that hand, but but by by bending down, you get a better sense that this thing is about to go up. And when it is at its highest rate, you can see how it looks stressed. All right, so at this point, it bends down almost as if curving into itself, and then it goes up. And simply doing that gives your animation. A bit more realism to simply just jumps that start from their rest state. All right, um, they're not real, rarely ever are they real. All right, so you want to take note of that in your own work. Okay, just to make this messy looking thing, just messing up my mission. Okay, so, so again, the same concept applies: a squashing and a stretching, and our ball to squashing and stretching. Okay, you may need to work on the timing of that ball a little more to give it to make it look real. This ball, but you can already see the idea of squash and stretch all right so we also begin to talk about timing 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 all right so timing has to do with um the your the tool which which your uh, how would i put this the tool you use to show the weight of the object and how that weight affects the speed or the motion of the character or the object at the beginning or at the termination of an action. All right, it's all—it's almost like talking about uh, how to show the inertia of an object at the beginning in motion and at its ending. All right, and it, it helps you to give a sense of the speed of the object. All right, um, so how? Do I should just show you the example of what they have here. Now, when an object is pushed, if that object has no um, no weight, or if the object is very heavy, when you push it, there you require a lot more um, force to push it and to make it start. All right, so it may move slower, 
than another object that may not weigh as much, which means that the same applying the same force pushes it a lot further before you let it go and it takes motion by itself. All right, so you use timing to um, help uh, you show that sense of weight, that sense of weight that you have in a scene. A normal animation, if I key this here and say 15, I key this here. When I play this, it just seems to begin without any without any um, force, any strong force pushing it. And then you don't get a sense of the weight. Because if I animate this big this box and a say a small box beside it and do the same thing to them at frame one and at frame fifteen. Do this. Doing this you not you don't get a sense that one weighs more than the other because they seem to move at the same time. Alright? But if I did this in my animation if I did this in my animation that's bringing now while they may even still get to the top at the same time the fact that this delays a bit it is a way in the timing at which it moves gives you a sense that this weighs a bit more than this one um, on, this, uh, on this smaller box. And that is how you get uh, that sense of the weight of the object. So the timing is important. These two things, they weigh the same. But by interpolating a bit of the uh, frames to uh, give a sense of slower movement at the beginning, you get that idea of weight, all right? All right, so if we're, we're going to talk next about anticipation, um, this is anticipation over here, and you can see how um, you, you may not notice that you have seen this a lot of times as little kids when you watch animation. Uh, when you watch cartoons, but in a cartoon, uh, say Tom and Jerry, you notice that before Tom wants to run, he seems to pull back uh, almost in the opposite direction that he wants to run in. And um, after watching a lot of cartoons, you already know what he's going to do as soon as he pulls back like that, or as soon as he turns back and then goes into a very quick spin in the direction opposite to where. That which, where that he's going, you already get a sense already that oh, he's going to run that other way, but he's picking up uh, speed by moving in that direction, the opposite direction. Uh, anticipation is the same thing. Uh, if I can put it this way, there are three steps in every action. There's the preparation for the action, there's the action itself, and then there's the stopping or termination of that action. Anticipation is how you create the sense of the preparation for the motion in itself. How, what do you do to show your audience without saying it that this object is about to do something? You may have not shown the action in itself yet, but you want to prepare the audience by making your character do something else um, before. Um, in, our, in our scene, we've done so with the use of squashing. Now, if I started this frame like this, say from frame 10, this ball, this is frame 10, it's on the floor, the ball is on the floor, and then I do this, I go this number of frames. In your mind, except if you think that the ball is deflating, <laughs> you already get a sense that it is picking up, it is pa packing up um, energy to go up, to go up, so that when you see it going up, you already understand where it got all the energy that is compacted to make that motion. Uh, the same thing with this other character over here. By 
going down all right and i can even push that even more like going down so far you already get a sense that it is about to go up i get you already get the sense that it is about to go up simply by the motion that it made downward and that's the idea of anticipation creating um creating a an expectation of the action by the uh action or motion that your character or object makes before the action you can also use anticipation when you are trying to show the direction that something is going to go in all right um so your character looks off screen for instance you already know that whatever is happening next is going to happen from that direction of screen not the other direction all right so um it's a way to help people direct attention or help your audience direct direct attention it can also be a way to reveal something all right your character is about to do something and you want your audience to know that oh, this is what is about to do um you now there are animations there are motions that you can create to uh, show that an example is if a character is about to steal something the first things that you can do for instance is to make him look left and right very quickly and then look at the object that he wants to steal simply doing that already gives an our audience an idea that oh he's sly he's looking around seeing if there's anybody who will catch him and then when you look at the object they already know that okay he wants to steal this is the object of his desire is the reason why he's being careful about who can see him uh, uh around all right so anticipation is really important it is used a lot in a lot of cartoons because it helps to give to sell the action even before the action sometimes when you see um your cartoon character pull in one direction they don't even have to show you the direction he finally run towards by just pulling in one direction you know the direction so in one or two frames before your eyes can catch it the character can be can dart off screen and yet you still know where he darted to simply because you you could read the anticipation that was created beforehand all right so that is important um